Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm just getting us loaded up to go on Facebook. Um, we'll give everybody a couple of minutes to log in while I go over some of the basics. Uh, for those of you who are new to our virtual plant clinics, thanks for joining us. Uh, David does these just about every other Thursday on topics that are uh, relevant to the current weather and environmental conditions. Uh, so this time we're doing house plants. Um, so for those of you who are actually joining us through our Zoom platform, we can't see you or hear you uh, since this is a webinar. Um, so if you have questions during the class, then you'll actually send those in through the Q&A box in your menu. Uh, if you are on Facebook, you can type questions into the comments and I'll be monitoring those as well. Um, so David, I know you've got a full program, so I'm going to go ahead and let you get started. Thanks as always for being with us. All right, well, good afternoon, Sally. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, like Sally had mentioned, we try to pick a topic or talk about things that might be timely. Uh, also, again, it's a conversation. I'd like to have as, uh, invite as many questions as we can. So I keep this open. We'll take a couple breaks you know, with your questions, comments, share your ideas. But I think of myself, definitely, I'm sort of ready for spring. It's been a pretty gloomy, cold you know, winter with the snow and the ice and the cold temperatures basically all the way through the month of January. Uh, getting a little bit of a break today, but, you know, it's not spring yet. And I'm talking with customers, you know, as you guys are coming into the garden center and you're anxiously looking around and just, you know, dreaming about spring. I get it. You know, it's, the days are short. Uh, it's been cold, it's been kind of gloomy, cloudy, snowy. So everybody's looking for that little bit of a uh, green up in their life. And so a lot of this turns our attentions indoors um, and we can still get our, our connection with the plants, keep our green thumb active and enjoy the beauty and wonderful plants inside our homes. So that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. I'm going to start out talking about some of the flowering plants because that really kind of cheers us up. Of course, we'll have a segment that talks about pest issues and about uh, some of the issues that go with just how you care for your plants when they're inside to keep them looking good. And then if time permits, you know, a couple ideas for foliage plants as well. So it's kind of a mixed bag uh, today. And again, please, 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 you know, if you have any questions or things that you want, want to uh, discuss, type your message in there to the chat uh, thing. And then Sally uh, will communicate that information to me. So like I said, uh, when you're growing plants indoors, you know, these plants they have the same requirements, you know, when they're growing outside, hey, they're going to need the basics of sun, air, water, some nutrients. Um, and we're trying to recreate those conditions inside our homes, uh, which is where the challenge comes in, because most of the plants that we are growing in our homes are actually tropical in nature. They come from South America, Central America, some of the islands where they normally would be growing in a very warm, humid environment with a very bright dappled light coming through a taller canopy of trees or those kind of conditions. And when we bring them inside the home, we're kind of putting them in the exact opposite. You know, the heat's on and the wintertime, the humidity's down. Uh, we're not getting necessarily the, the strongest light through there and the days are short. Uh, so it's, it's um, just, we got to be aware of that and try to create those conditions in our home. Uh, so in these sort of uh, days of winter, I wanted to begin by sharing a couple things about orchids. Um, I know we just had a more detailed class on that, but orchids, everybody's going to love orchids because, uh, again, they have these exotic looking flowers. They last an incredibly long time and they can be surprisingly easy to grow in our homes. Now, orchids, it represents a very large family of plants. It's either, depending who you talk about, the pros are still arguing, is it the largest or is it the second largest uh, family of plants? Both the, um, the aster family and the orchid family, you know, they're, they're still competing, duking this out based on sort of genetic analysis and stuff and changing every day. But we know that within the orchids, there's at least 800 genera and over 25,000 different species. So each one of these plants can kind of be a little different or a little unique in how it care for it and its culture. So this is one of the things I think that makes orchids so much fun is you can really go as far as you want in there with 25,000 different species to learn about, uh, getting to experience their flowers and learn about how to care for them. Uh, 
in a, in a broad sense though, well, let me back up and say, so of, of these 25,000 orcas, let me start this way. The one that is by far the easiest and by far the most common that we grow in our homes is this Phalaenopsis orchid, or sometimes referred to as a moth orchid here as an example. Uh, theoretically, I guess the way these flowers kind of dance around in the environment, that's supposed to look like a moth. Uh, I think one of the things that intimidates people about orchids, if you're new to it, is sometimes just the terminology and the language. So we start talking about Phalaenopsis orchid. Uh, that's just, that's the botanical name of this group of orchids that grows here. But they're characterized by, you'll sort of see the thick leathery leaf that's on here, you know, basal formation. If this was just growing in nature, these flower spikes would come cascading out and fall over. But in the greenhouse industry and for, and for designing, a lot of times we put them up on stakes just because a lot of us, including me, think it's more attractive when they're held in an upright form. Again, wide range of colors and stuff. One of the things that's really nice is if you get an orchid like this, you should really expect even like three months of bloom out of it and they will bloom longer. So when I say three months of bloom, keep in mind the pattern goes, you know, one bud opens, a second bud, a third bud, a fourth, they work their way down this stem. This flower will start to fade, this sour flower will fade, this one fades and sudden then to go down that pattern. So this entire spike will last you probably at least three months and it's not unusual to see them last even longer. Um, now in their native environment, these are what we call epiphytes. They don't grow in the soil. They actually grow up in tree branches and rock crevices and tropical environments. So their roots would just be dangling out here sort of in the open air and you'd be getting these frequent um, rain showers coming through. And as that water runs right over, they just literally absorbing their water straight out of the rain that cascades down. They're absorbing their nutrients out of the, the, the detritus, the little bits of decaying organic matter that collects in the tree branches and the rock crevices. And that's the kind of environment that they're adapted to. So with that in mind, uh, a lot of times there's one of two different media that we will grow them in. I would say the majority of growers like to use sphagnum moss. Uh, again, this is a natural product, has the growing media that's in there. Many of you know sphagnum moss. Uh, it's very spongy. You see it looks just like a sponge. It behaves like a sponge. And so it has this really great balance of being able to hold moisture, but maintaining excellent aeration around that. Again, this is what these orchids need because they're not adapted to growing in the soil. They're adapted to growing above ground in the air. And we just want to hold enough moisture around that root zone to keep it damp. So the number one problem that I see, literally like nine times out of 10, when somebody's having problems with their orchid, it's because it's too much water. Uh, these plants, that's the one thing that they won't tolerate. So the way I like to care for them is, you know, we water them thoroughly. See, I'm gonna take it out of spot. You can see how the roots are developing inside this sphagnum. Um, there is a drainage hole in the bottom. So I would take this over to the kitchen sink, water thoroughly till all that water is going throughout the bottom is thoroughly moistened throughout and then place it back into a decorative container. Now you'll wait until this thing gets almost scary dry. Uh, this is not recommended, but I'll just show you the extremes. I've had orchids where I'm walking past them and just, you know, bumping, moving the floor, suddenly it will fall over, it will tip over off the shelf. And that's a pretty good clue. This thing has definitely gotten completely dried out and dire needs of water. Let's not go quite that extreme, but, but they'll survive that. What they will not tolerate is really soaking wet conditions. Uh, the other thing that I'll just mention, because a lot of people, they're, they're always the next question I get is what do I do when they finish blooming? Uh, again, that's one thing with gardening, we can experiment. There's no one or right one or wrong way to do this. Some people don't know what to do and so they just leave it there and do nothing. And if you're lucky and the plant's really happy and doing well, you might get a little kiki, a little baby plant develops at the top here. Um, that's never really happened for me, but it, it can. What I'd like to do is as you go along this stem, you might be able to see these are, these are these buds. Each one of these buds are sometimes referred to as an eye. 
um, there's a dormant bud that's there. So in this case, when it's done flowering, I would probably cut it right here, just above this bud. Many times this bud will pop out and produce a second set of flowers. Now that second set of flowers is not as big and it's not as showy as the first set, but why not? You know, you get even a longer bloom time, get to enjoy that. Another choice is to just go all the way down to the bottom and completely remove that flower spike. Uh, the plant will go through usually just a very brief kind of resting period at the end of its flowering. We might back off even a little bit on the watering and fertilizer at that time, but then it will start to go and you'll see new leaf starting to grow out of here. Uh, continue through the growing season and like a bright indirect light. Uh, and they actually like very high humidity, but to get them to actually initiate flowering is they need warm days and cool nights. Your nighttime temperature needs to be about 10 or 15 degrees cooler than it is a day. So if you have this in your, your home or apartment and your thermostat set at 70 degrees or 68 degrees or whatever, if it's just at a constant temperature, it's not going to flower for you. But what works really well is sometimes if you put it outside in the summer or a cooler room where you get some chilly temperatures in the evening, then boom, that tends to initiate a new flower spike and they come up. So really easy plants, exotic, fun, uh, encourage you to play around with those. I'm just gonna show you a couple others. Um, and like I said, this is, like I said, people will teach entire classes just on this one orchid, uh, but we're just kind of introducing it. This is uh, what's called a Cattleya orchid, or sometimes people call it a corsage orchid. It's a totally different beast. It is an epiphyte. It does grow up in the tree branches, similar to the Phalaenopsis orchid, but this one really likes very coarse drainage. It likes, you know, brighter, almost sunny conditions. Uh, it's a little more challenging to grow in our homes, mostly because it needs brighter light conditions and does better with a little bit higher humidity. It can be done if you have the right environment, but it's, um, like I said, you work your way up to that. So you don't really start it. Cattleya orchids, most people are going to grow it in a orchid bark. This is a mix of fir bark. It's got some charcoal, some sponge rock. It's a, it's a much coarser drainage. Uh, it probably dries out faster than the sphagnum moss does. And so you, um, you may have to water more frequently, but the cattleya seem to do quite well in that. Uh, because they do better in drier conditions. Uh, just as sort of another example, put this in uh, what's called a Pathiopetalum orchid. This is a terrestrial orchid. This is one that does grow in soil, still really highly mended, very well drained soil. I think this particular grower is actually taking both sphagnum moss, some of the bark, um, and maybe even a little potting mix and blending these together. This again, it's a little bit trickier to grow. Uh, I've, I've had mixed success with it myself, finding just the right thing. And mostly I think it's finding the right media, the right drainage. Uh, but I just put these in to give you an idea that the range of them that are out there, they can be epiphytes, they can be terrestrial, they have different growing medias. Don't let any of this stuff or the terminology kind of overwhelm you. Um, it's, it's just a learning process and that's the thing that makes it fun. Other flowering plants that you might want to have in your home, that are very reliable, uh, is of course African violets. Now, people like African violets for many good reasons, but probably first and foremost is African violet is really the only plant that I can think of that you would have in your home that could be in constant bloom. Uh, you could have these flowering throughout the entire year. Most of our orchids kind of like, because they like that warm day, cool night, they might peak their bloom season in, a, uh, in the winter, whereas African violets is something that you can continue to grow throughout the season. And the background is what's called a streptocarpus. It's a close relative of the African violet. They're in the same families, all grow in the sort of same conditions. African violets also do very well with indoor lighting. They don't need the, the bright light intensity that some other plants need. So this is a favorite, you know, uh, they do, like I said, if you have fluorescent grow lights, not just a regular, you know, office lighting, um, but have a grow light. So we have the full spectrum of light in there. They, again, can be sensitive to water. A classic thing is 
if you get cold water on their foliage, um, they are sensitive to that and it will leave spots on there. So most of the time, these are what we call watered from the bottom where you might set the, the um, African violet in a little saucer or tray and let it sort of absorb that water up from the bottom, just capillary action in there. Or there are even African violet pots that are designed to make this a little bit easier for you, ones that actually hold moisture in there. Um, but so you don't have to actually pour it in from the top, you can add it from the bottom. Again, there is a tendency to overwater these. To me, um, African violets really, again, do a little better on the slightly dry side of things. So these, the only thing I'll say is be a little tentative, attentive to the watering. And beyond that, uh, again, this is a plant that can last for years, that you can propagate yourself from cuttings to share. Um, I know some people even go to the thing of hybridizing and growing from seed. So it, it's anywhere where you can just enjoy it, give us a house gift, enjoy it while it flowers, or something that you can grow, propagate, and pass along kind of year to year. Then one more flowering plant that I just wanted to show, um, and many of you know this, but it's the Spathophyllum or the Peace Lily. Uh, it's in my slide set here because it's probably maybe the only plant that you can actually get to flower in a lower light level. And as we talk about light, this is one that will tolerate lower light conditions. It doesn't necessarily require direct sun. It doesn't even require a really bright sun. It can live in uh, where it's not getting any direct lighting. To get them to flower and look really nice like this though, it does help we get um, a little bit of indirect light on them. So again, it's, a, it's a, a huge favorite because it's one of the few things that you may be able to get to flower, let's say in a, an interior office or someplace where you're not getting really great lighting on there. Uh, since I'm talking about lighting, uh, I think that lighting is probably the single most important factor that you need to think about in terms of selecting plants for your home. Again, plants, I'm always saying they need sun, water, you know, and a, and a few nutrients. So when we're inside, light becomes the limiting the factor that's there. So if you look sort of to the back corner uh, here, we, it's, uh, this is a Western exposure or Southern exposure. So there's actually good sunlight coming outside, but it's a, um, you see sort of a sheer curtain that's in there. So this is all direct light. It's not what I call, or indirect light. It's not direct sun. It's sun that's coming, hitting the window. When sunlight hits the window, a significant amount of it through refraction basically bounces off of that window through the glass. And then there's also, as the sunlight passes through the glass, keep in mind, it diminishes as you move further back from it. So a lot of times what you might think of as bright light or even direct sun, the plant's not really getting all that. So this I'm going to call very bright, um, indirect light, but not anything I'll call direct sun. As you move further back from the window, even though uh, we're still getting some pretty good light in here, uh, I've got skylights in here. So this is just a little patch of skylight from the skylights that's hitting it. So as we move from the window, like I said, as you move from the light source, the intensity diminishes at an exponential rate. So literally there's only maybe one one hundredth the amount of light in this corner of the room as there is over here. So I'm going to put lower light level plants in here like this Chinese evergreen. Um, most of our flowering plants, like I said, are just going to require more light. Uh, if you start to see things like, you know, I brought in this little um, primrose, for example. This is a plant that I'm going to say, hey, this might provide us a little bit of seasonal color. It's charming. It's wonderful. They thrive in cool conditions. Some of them are even a little bit hardy enough to go outside, but it's not something that you're going to sustain in your home. Uh, we sell roses. We sell some of these things that are just for sort of seasonal color in your home, but they're not going to be sustainable in the levels of light we have. Uh, so even here where I've got a little cyclamen set on the table, that's not really a sustainable environment for it. There's not enough sunlight to really keep it going. Uh, we have it there, enjoy it for several months. But if you're going to try to grow that from year to year, you're going to have to be able to provide better conditions because, uh, again, you can take it outside, but it likes cool temperatures and, and we need to know that. Uh, so, again, take a close look around your home, 
understand the light conditions. Then when you come see us, uh, we can really communicate well in terms of what you need. Other things, and I'm just putting all this out here so we can get some questions, but um, watering. Like I said, lighting is my first concern that goes on there. Watering is right up there with it. Uh, the, the story on this plant, uh, and this great thing, you know, plants, they, we, we carry so many memories and emotional ties with them. This is a spathophyllum, you know, peace lily. You can even see, I think, little remnants of a flower uh, up in this corner. Uh, this was brought to me by a client uh, just this, this winter. Uh, th this plant had been in his father's funeral service. So there was a lot of emotional attachment that gone with it. Uh, he brought it into us in this condition, just looking for some help. And of course, I'm looking at a plant in this condition. And I try to get all the history and I'm talking to about understanding because really putting this plant in the trash might have been the smart move. But he has, again, it was his, it was part of his father's um, funeral. So we're, we're not even going to entertain that idea. Uh, I I wanted to take it out to examine the root system on, but I knew better than to do that indoors. Uh, I could tell there was going to be an issue in there. So I put it on the cart, wheel it outside. When I lay it on its side to see what's going on, you guys see all this stuff down? Water came splashing out of this. I literally, it's like jumping back, you know, kind of freaked out because all this funky, smelly, foul smelling water just dumps right out of the container splashes all over on the ground um, that's in there. And you can't hardly see it, but this is just this jet black in here. So the whole issue in here, and spathophyllum is a plant that likes moist conditions, not soaking wet. It's in this pot, it's in this container. There's no drainage holes in this container. So every time the plant gets watered, that water fills up in here, just like it's filling up a sink or a bathtub. It can't escape. So this plant is left basically just totally immersed, soaking in water. Uh, the roots need water, but they also must have air to breathe. Without any air, any oxygen left in the soil because it's just soaking wet, uh, these roots literally just start to drown and suffocate. So in my opinion, I always, 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 I'm looking for containers that have a drainage hole that allow the excess water to dra drain out of it, or you set yourself up for this type of problem. If you have what I'm gonna call like a cash pot, this is sort of like a decorative pot. Here, see, I can take the orchid out and I can go to the sink and water, let it drain. You know, there's no drainage holes in here and I can put it back in here as a decorative container. I would never want to actually pot it directly in here. Because then again, you have this constant problem of water not being able to escape from there. But uh, we took this plant, uh, Louis, Louis took this project on, uh, basically removed all the existing soils out there, washed that away, trimmed the dead roots out of it, brought it, trimmed the dead parts of the plant out, brought it back to basically what was left, you know, got back to as much healthy tissue as we can. Mm -hmm. This um, pot actually belonged to his father as well. So we were able to take this plant from the funeral service and place it into a pot that originally belonged to the family and give them the right care. And you can't see this is a pot inside a pot. So it's inside, it actually has drainage holes, gave the customer um, watering instructions. And I'm sure that one went home to a good success. Another little story, just because then it reminded me, I had this other unique experience just this winter. This was a 60 year old Christmas cactus. Uh, it had been, been passed down, I think, from great grandma to grandma to, to mom to, to daughter. So this thing has a, a long legacy to it. Mm -hmm. um, it had been in the existing pot for 20 years. So the plant, it's again amazing how well this plant looks and it's, it's beautiful but uh, you know when you've got a 60 year old plant in a 20 year old pot of uh, potting mix degrades over time you know the organic matter and breaks down and decomposes uh the drainage properties will change over time in this particular case this cactus all those roots had nowhere to grow they form this really tight dense mat across the surface of it 
to where water could barely penetrate down into it. And it had no room to grow with the roots that are in there. So uh, we took this one and what I call my contraption. I'm so proud of it. I put it in my slide set today. Uh, essentially, we had to take it out of the pot, took a soil screen in here, put a, um, a trug under it to catch it, and literally had to wash out all the soil, the old soil that's in there. This has good, healthy roots in there. That's what I'm trying to show in the picture here. It's good color. That's what they sh should look like not black and mushy like the other ones. Um, and this plant was, again, I think it's gonna be a big success. Got it in a new pot. This picture doesn't quite do it justice how well it looks, but uh, you can see we just got out into a, into a larger pot, fresh soil, um, and went on there. So I'm a big fan of repotting at least once, I'm gonna say every three years, maybe every five years. Uh, like this plant had gone 20 years, you know, that's a bit extreme, this in there. So. Uh, that's always, I think, a, a good way to rejuvenate or renew plants. If they're just getting too big to handle, uh, sometimes we can divide them. You can bring them down in size. Uh, there's all kinds of options we can talk about. So having said that, I'm going to take a breather. We're going to see if we have any questions. And we'll see how this goes. And from here on after this, we'll talk about some pest issues. Thanks, David. We do have questions on that Christmas cactus was fun. My mom has one that is her pride and joy, but it's only seven years old. So uh, she's a ways to go. All right. Uh, first it's question. Yours next. So get ready. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yep. I got, I got, I know I have big shoes to fill now. Um, all right. So the first question is about, um, I think that this is an anthurium. It, it has brown leaf tips, and I know a lot of plants get that. Um, so if this person's noticing that their plant has brown leaf tips, what do you recommend? Yeah, yeah so it's probably not an insect or disease. The anthurium is very close related, the same family as the spatophyllum, the, the peace lily. You can see that in their flower structure. Uh, they do like to be kept sort of consistently moist. Uh, if they get too dry, they'll tell you suddenly with the leaves flopping over. Brown tips, it's because the leaf, I'm trying to think how, how we say it, it's transpiring. When I say uh, people, we sweat, right? We perspire. We lose moisture through our skin. Plants transpire. They're losing moisture through their leaves. And if it's losing water faster than it gets replenished, you'll get those brown tips in there. So it can be um, just it got too dry. Uh, most likely what I see is because of low humidity. These plants grow in tropical areas of like 50, 60, 70, 80, 90% humidity. We bring it inside and in the winter time, uh, you know, you might be running 10% humidity in your house or something. So if it's in a bathroom environment or near a kitchen sink, anything with good humidity uh, helps. I know you might even already have a humidifier around there. Uh, pebble trays where you put a little saucer under there that allows water to evaporate and keep the humidity up there, spritzing it. Um, I find a lot of times anything that boosts the humidity, that can be really helpful. The, the third thing I'm going to say, but this is less likely, but we can also see that with, um, I'm, well, I'm going to use the word fertilizer burn, but it's a combination of not just applying too much fertilizer, but if if salts from our fertilizer are accumulating in the soil because it's not draining correctly, then there literally gets to be so much uh, nutrients, so much fertilizer salts in there, it starts to draw moisture out of the plant. But I would focus my attentions first on anything you boost the humidity. I had the anthurium in uh, a couple of homes ago where I had the bathroom, I had nice skylights, good lighting, high humidity, and they just thrive in that condition. Thanks, David. All right, next question is, can you discuss um, control options for aphids and mites? Uh, yes, but let's let's get through a couple, see if we have any other sort of like cultural questions because my next slides, I'm gonna talk about mites and I'll make sure to touch on aphids. Great. Okay, here's some questions for watering. Um, this person has heard about either putting eggshells in water or putting banana peels in water before you water your indoor plants. Is that something you've heard of and is that a good idea? I've certainly heard of it. Um, I, hey, I don't have any real problems with it. I think it's probably more of a feel good thing than it really is going to help the plants. The idea behind that is that the eggshells that you that that water is going to leach out some of the calcium and the magnesium that's in the shells. 
those are essential nutrients the plant needs, you know, um, bananas, you know, are high in potassium. So the idea on this is that these nutrients will leach out of the organic material that you're putting in there and actually have this, hey, kind of like homemade fertilizer. So not a bad idea in theory, but in reality, the, these nutrients are not really very water soluble and the amount that's gonna actually leach out of the materials is so minimal. I've never actually done this, but then I would kind of be weighing that. It seems like kind of a messy thing to be doing. I'm like, okay, do I want to create a mess for something that's that, you know, insignificant? Uh, so I'm not saying don't do it, uh, but I'm, I'm a little skeptical of it. You know, I'm, I'm all for experimenting and trying. It sounds like more trouble than it's worth. Got it. All right. Uh, next question is about lighting. Um, can you give us an explanation about the different light colors for plants, blue, red, and white? So it's, I think this is maybe referring to artificial light sources. Right, right, exactly. So when you, when you look at, um, you think of, you know, you run a, a light through a, a prism, you know, and it splits out all the colors of the rainbow that's in there. So plants are primarily using the spectrums at the two opposite ends from ultraviolet and infrared in there. So, you know, the red lighting is very, you know, higher in energy. It's a lot that triggers the photo period in the plant that determines a lot of its flowering characteristics. You know, at the other end of it, sort of the blue end of that spectrum, uh, that's where a lot of the energy that the plant needs for photosynthesis goes on. So what happens in regular indoor lighting, you might have what's called a cool white. I'm sure we've all seen that. That's kind of on the blue end of the spectrum, you might see what's called a warm white. That's gonna be on the red end of the spectrum. When you're growing, when you're getting a grow light, it's been designed to capture both ends of that spectrum. If you're just, so if you're growing plants under household lighting, you're getting part of the spectrum. If you're using a grow light, it's the full spectrum, which is especially important if you're trying to flower plants. So, so yeah, if you're doing this, Get a grow light. They're they're widely available, inexpensive. You can get them tubes, bulbs, LED. You don't need a special thing. They'll plug into a regular um, light fixture. You know, just finding the right one for you. Okay, great. Um, okay, next question is about orchids. So I'm going to say quick for anybody who has orchid questions. We I'll ask David, uh, but we also had a full orchid class on Tuesday. And if you weren't able to attend that, it was fabulous. Um, so feel free to hit reply on your email or contact me and I'll send you the link. Um, so the question is, my orchids are healthy and well watered. They have, it's growing new leaves, but it hasn't flowered in three to four years. They're in bright and direct light and I fertilize a few times in the summer. What am I missing? Yeah, so, so we're talking about usually what happens is it's a temperature change where they need to be 10 or 15 degrees cooler at night than they are during the day. Uh, so what has worked amazingly well for me uh, and everybody, again, if this works for your environment, during the growing season, during, you know, once we get out of frost with temperature above 50, let's say we're going in that May, June time period, I will, I like to put my orchids outdoors. Uh, not in direct sun, you have to have the right environment. You need to be a little bit of a sheltered environment where the wind's not going to destroy them, where the sun's not going to burn them. But if you have a right environment, you know, under a shade tree or, you know, a, a canopy or something, uh, when they're outside, I'll leave them outside even pretty well into October. I'll even let temperatures you know, usually 50 is a low temperature, but I've left orchids out there, Phalaenopsis orchids have gone down even into the 40 degrees, low 40s. Um, I actually give them a little bit of a chill experience and then bring them inside. And once they've had that kind of cold period, that usually um, pops them into bloom. If that's not, if you don't have the right environment, then you'll need to find, maybe you've got a room in your house that's kind of drafty, uh, like within our, our Fair Oaks store here, this studio where I'm, this is this room is always about five or 10 degrees cooler than the rest of the store. There's windows on two sides, it's drafty. So try to find an area where you can give it a chill time for let's say at least four weeks, six weeks, and then bring it back into your regular temperatures. I bet you'll see it flower. Cool, okay, that's good information. Um, all right, next about peace lilies. This person hasn't been able to get their peace lily to flower. 
the plant is in a low light area and it usually gets watered when the soil is halfway dry, what do they need to do to encourage it to flower? Yeah, that's, that's probably a lighting issue uh, because there's again a difference between a plant that's going to tolerate low light levels. So you can take a piece of lily, put it in a corner of the doctor's office or something, you know, or, I know where I go get Chinese food, you know, it can sit there and it can live under those conditions. Uh, but to actually get it thriving, to get it to where it's going to blossom for you, it's probably going to need to increase the amount of light it's getting. So either moving it to closer to a window, adding an artificial light, something to increase the um, amount of light that's available to it is probably the first thing to do. The others, now a lot of these plants I didn't mention, um, they actually want them, I'm gonna use the word slightly pot bound, kind of squeezed. Uh, a lot of times you'll see they always look like the pots are a little bit smaller than they should be. That also helps to promote flowering because you'll take some of these plants, if you put it in a really large pot, you'll get vegetative growth, 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 but it won't really start blooming until it kind of gets in that squeezed condition. So that might be something else you could look at. Okay. Um, all right, next question is about a Neanthabella palm. Um, the leaves became brittle. This person has had it for a couple of months. She repotted it a few days ago, washed off the roots, put it in fresh potting soil. She's been watering it when the top feels dry and she's been trying to keep it in indirect light. What are the chances that it will recover? Is it bad to move it around? It's in an eight inch pot. Uh, to me, palms, I don't have a big success record with palms. They're, they're, everybody loves them, but they're not the easiest plant to grow indoors. Again, I think a lot of it, they really appreciate the higher humidity. They're a little sensitive to watering and stuff. Sounds like you're giving it the right care. Uh, you did all the right things. So now it's kind of a wait and see deal. I'm hoping when you repotted it, the roots looked like they were in good, healthy condition. Um, now it's kind of a wait and see game. Uh, you'll notice I didn't really talk about fertilizer much. I think we put way too much emphasis on that. Um, you know, that's, I, I only bring that because that's not going to make it revive itself or a miraculous thing. Uh, just kind of stick with what you're doing. And, and I just wish you the best of luck. Let's, um, Sally, if it's okay with you, I'd like to go to a couple slides because I, I said that I would cover some of the pest issues and I'd like to at least hit on that. And then we might be able to still get a couple questions in. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, again, most of what we see, 90% of what we see really are just cultural issues. I mean, lighting, watering, uh, fertilizing, those kind of things. But there can be insect problems, just like we have out in the garden. So I want to talk about probably the most common one that we get are fungus gnats. Um, these gnats, you can see, I like this image, it's got a dime in there, it gives you that perspective of how small they are. These little gnats buzz around and make a nuisance of themselves. They're attracted to bright lights. So you sit down to have your dinner and next thing they're kind of floating around in front of your face, uh, just being kind of a nuisance. They don't bite, they don't sting. Uh, they don't really barely even harm plants unless it's you know little seedlings in very high populations. But nobody wants little gnats buzzing around their house or in front of their face. So I get it. Um, their life cycle is this is the adult gnat. They'll mate, they'll, that adult gnat might live for a week. Um, they mate, they lay eggs in the soil, and then those larvae develop in the soil. They feed on the decaying organic matter that's there. So our pots, our soil, hey, we've got compost and bark in there, it, uh, decay, decaying organic matter from the roots. Uh, it's moist. So we've got this um, diet, ideal environment you know, and that larvae will live down in the ground until it emerges out, you know, as an adult. This whole process will take somewhere about two to three weeks going from an egg through a larvae to an adult. And so they reproduce quickly, um, but don't, don't like uh, panic about it. You know, like I say, don't bite, sting, spread disease, or they're just, but nobody wants pests in the house, I get. So there's a lot of different control options. What you see in that image is a, uh, called yellow sticky trap. This is just a glue board. They're attracted to that bright yellow color. I say it's kind of like a moth to the flame. They go flying towards that bright yellow color and it's covered with a very sticky glue and they get stuck on there. So glue board, it's really easy, no pesticides involved and it works pretty well at monitoring the problem or just managing a little bit of a nuisance level. 
it doesn't really fix the problem its entirety, but it can knock down the population. Uh, to really get rid of them, we're probably also going to need to treat the soil. And I, I'm gonna show you the control measures. I'm gonna talk about the pests and then I'll show you the control options. So the other, and somebody called in here, um, spider mites. Um, this is a very common pest. Uh, they're kind of ubiquitous in terms of they're not selective. There's some plants they like more than others, but they can get on almost anything. We run into these on citrus trees, which are really popular and they're kind of hard to manage in that. Um, they'll get into ivy uh, and that's really extremely hard to manage, but you'll find them in dracaenas and you know, a whole host of different plants that's there. Uh, this, uh, this image right here, this is the egg. And again, these are greatly magnified and this is the adult mite. Uh, you really need about what I'm gonna call 10X lens to see them, they're that small. If you have really sharp eyes and really look closely, you can spot them, but they're, they're easy to miss. When you get a really big population, um, they'll start forming this webbing and you can see this, these mites that are going around in the webbing. So they pinch the leaf, they pinch it, their mouths like little pinchers, they, they pinch that and they suck the sap out of it. So each time they're doing this and they're on the underside of the leaf, they're on the bottom, so they're hidden. They're, they're biting and sucking the sap out of the cells. And up top, it starts to get what we call this stipple look, like these, you see all the little color starts to go out of there. Um, they, again, you can go from an egg to an adult in like a 10 to 14 day cycle. So their survival strategy is they just build up really big numbers really fast. And so a small problem can go, become a big problem relatively quickly. Mealybug and scale are both, they're closely related. They're both what we call piercing sucking insect. They stick their mouth into the leaf tissue like a little hypodermic needle, like a little syringe. And then they sit there and they suck the sap as it comes out from the leaf. As they're sucking the sap out of that leaf, they'll secrete this sticky residue. And then we'll sometimes get this black mold growing on the leaf um, as a result of that feeding activity. Uh, again, these are common in a broad range of plants. The, the mealy bug covers itself with kind of this waxy, cottony, filamentous stuff. It's pretty easy to spot. Sometimes people think it looks more like a, a disease than an insect, but it is an insect. Uh, this is what's called a brown scale. They're closely related, as I said, but they have this hard, waxy shell. So you don't see the legs and the head and the abdomen and thorax. You don't see all that stuff. They're covered under this waxy shell. So in terms of management options, see, that's where I want to go. A uh, couple, couple things here. Okay. So these, what I call them, this, this is a, um, they just call systemic houseplant insect control. So this is a um, this insecticide called imidacloprid it is the, the fancy name on there. But these granules, and you can also get in a tablet form, but these are put in the soil. They dissolve, absorb up through the roots into the plant. So when you have a piercing sucking insect, something like uh, scale, mealybug, uh, aphids, that's what somebody had asked about, aphids, this, does control them, but it's going to be a slower, more gradual thing and you have to keep up because it's gonna take itself a week or two to actually migrate up into the plant tissue. It really only kills them when they're in the very young immature stage. So it's something that you have to do repeat applications about every four to six weeks and you have to stick with it several times. But this does give good control. But like I said, somebody asked about aphids, knocks aphids out you know, real quickly and easily does relatively good on mealybugs. Uh, again, not, not a cure-all. Scale are pretty hard to manage. Uh, does great job on white fly. I'm trying to think of some of the common pests that we've run into. What it does not treat, it's really important, is it does not control spider mites. So this, again, is important in terms of getting good identification on. Also, because this is systemic, it's absorbed into the plant, we only put them on ornamentals. I would not put this on food crops. Like if you're growing citrus trees, we don't want to use this. Um, 
if you're having problems with these pests and you're able to, I am also a big fan of horticultural oil. This is a natural product. It's a highly distilled petroleum oil and you spray the plant with it top to bottom, you know, all the nooks and crannies and the water evaporates off and it leaves this film of oil. And so with things like spider mites, it will coat and suffocate the eggs. It will cover the mites and control them. Um, it's something you must do outdoors. So it's not the easiest. You would have to take your plants out into a balcony or a garage or someplace when it's not too cold, spray them, let it dry, bring them back inside. And you'll probably also have to do that two or three times. Um, that systemic product also controls the fungus nest and that's probably our most popular control net. So Sal, where do we go? It's uh, it's two forty-five. Um, you tell me if we're going to take any questions or whether we got to pull a plug or. Yeah, we do a couple of questions that we had mostly because I know we're we're at we just end at two forty-five usually, but we have some questions to repeat the names of the insecticide and the name of the the grant. Oh, sick. this may be the same thing. The granules used for the aphids and the mealybugs. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, I was trying here. Maybe this will work. Uh, this is just, this is sold under a bunch of different names. Uh, okay. So this is the bonide houseplant, uh, in systemic houseplant insect control. We have this sold under two or three different names of, so don't get too hung up on exactly it's this. The part I'm, I'm trying to avoid saying almost is in the fine print, the active ingredient on this is called imidacloprid. I don't think I can even speak that Let, oh here i can i can see it. it's i m i d a c l o p r i d so that's a mouthful but that's the active ingredient um you know cs we can always help with that again all season spray oil this can be used on house plants flowers trees shrubs um a whole host of different things one word of caution or two words of caution if your plants in flower, do not get it on the blooms. If you spray this like on an orchid or an African violet, or if it gets on the flowers, um, it does ruin the flowers. So this is really for foliage uh, plants only. Uh, and, and again, you don't wanna do this in the house because it's a petroleum oil. If that gets on your flooring, your fabrics, your upholstery, it will leave an oil stain. So that's something we do outside. And we sell, okay, we just had a question about selling ladybugs. Do we have, when do we get the ladybugs then usually? Yeah, ladybugs are very seasonal uh, because they can't be shipped. You know, during freezing plants, but... So we're probably looking at May, June. Uh, okay. We'll start getting those depending on the weather. Okay. Um, what's the best uh, systemic insect control? Okay, will, oh, sorry. Will the systemic insect control being shown, does that work for fungus gnats? Yes. It does. Okay, that's good. I think that about covers it. I know we're out of time. Um, David, thank you. Everybody, just a reminder, if you didn't get your question answered today, uh, we are more than happy to follow up with you guys via email, by phone, whatever works for you. I'm saying we, I mean, you can email me and I'll forward it to David. Uh, I do grow house plants, but I do not know a lot about the things that David knows. Um, so I get help from David too. But uh, so feel free to hit reply if you're on Zoom to those confirmation emails. That goes directly to me. I'll share your questions with David. If you're on Facebook, uh, you can email me at esperos at um, or contact us through our website. We have a contact us form that goes to one of my colleagues and he will also share it with David. I think they might, they sit close to next to each other. So they see each other all the time. Um, thank you all so much, David. Thank you. Uh, we will see you in a couple of weeks and yeah. more. I have decided what I'm doing. So if you have ideas or something you wanna hear about, feel free to support that suggestion. Let oh, I do love seeing you guys. And uh, keep in mind, we do have greenhouses at all three of our store locations. There's not many greenhouses in the area. So stop by, get, even if you just walk through and just breathe in a little bit of tropical air or stuff. It's That's really how fun. I was introduced to Maryfield, was visiting the greenhouse in the winter. I was desperate for some plants. And now I, now I work here. So, um, all right. Thank you all so much, David. Have a good afternoon. Everybody else, thank you. Bye. Take care.